Welcome to mini lesson 19. Today we're developing a few tools to do geometry in high dimensional phase space. We're going to start by talking about Gaussian integrals, which are a really important tool even beyond phase space considerations. And then we're going to end up by introducing the idea of a hypersphere, which is just a sphere in dimension greater than three. Um, and write out some expressions for how to understand the geometry of hyperspheres. So we're still in Crane section 2.5. There's a little bit about Gaussian integrals and hyperspheres uh, in the ap Appendix B mathematical methods part of Crane's textbook. So just to remind you of where we are and why, um, to specify the microstate of a monatomic ideal gas, we need to give the position and momentum components of every atom in the gas and so that's a lot of numbers to have to specify all of these ordered uh, six tuples of x y z p x p y p z for every atom and so you can't deal with these just by listing them and so it helps to define an abstract 6n dimensional space which we call the phase space of the ideal gas where each number in one of these six tuples is associated to a coordinate axis. Right? And so phase space is a very high dimensional space. And the important thing is that if you have a gas where you've identified macro state specifications, you constrain the region of phase space where these coordinates can lie. Right? And then all we need to do is measure the geometry of the allowed regions of phase space to count the microstates and obtain the multiplicity of the specified macrostate. So as we showed last time, if you've got small n, it's fairly easy to figure out how to do that. But for large n, it's a little bit harder, and we'll show why. And so over here is a good example that I think you should always keep in your mind as the general idea of what we're doing if you had two atoms constrained to move on a line, the phase space uh, is four-dimensional, but we can, for an ideal gas, independently look at the momentum and spatial parts of the phase space. And the momentum part is two-dimensional. And the constraint given by the total energy of the system U defines a circle of radius R sub P not sure why I have an N here, I forgot. Doesn't matter. Circle of radius R sub P, where the R sub P is determined by U, and U in turn is determined by all the P values, right? And so your job in analyzing this system is only to measure the circumference of the circle. And that's, so that's not difficult. But measuring the analogy of circumference in a high dimensional space is a little bit more difficult. And that's what we're doing in the next two lessons. But to start, I'm going to teach you a trick. And the trick is how to do what's called a Gaussian integral. So it's a very important um, integral in many areas of physics, not just in statistical mechanics. What we'd like to do is evaluate the definite integral, which I'll call i. That's the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus x squared. That's a Gaussian function. So it's like a bell curve centered on zero, x equals zero, over all x, right? And so this is going to help us work in high dimensional spaces uh, for a funny reason that I'll start to tell you about today. But first, let's just figure out how to do it. So what we're going to do is note that we could also write this integral in terms of the variable y. Why not, right? It doesn't matter whether you call it x, y, z, whatever. So if we wanted to, we could write i squared as the integral over all x of the Gaussian times the integral over all y of the Gaussian. And then if you rearrange the integral signs, you get the double integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dx dy. I mean, so, so far it actually looks like we've made our life more difficult, but it's not true. 
Because what you can notice is that the expression in the exponential is r squared in polar coordinates. And we know how to convert the area element dx dy into polar coordinates. So we can write the i squared now instead of over all x and y, we're going over all of the 2D plane parametrized by r and theta, right? But the dx dy becomes r dr d theta. x squared plus y squared becomes r squared. We now integrate r from 0 to infinity. We integrate theta from 0 to 2 pi, okay? This integral we can do by a u substitution, right? Because basically the derivative of r squared is already down here as part of the polar area element. And so do that integral by yourself, go ahead. You're gonna get i squared equals pi or i equals the square root of pi. So we have this really special result that the integral of a Gaussian over all x is just the square root of pi. I mean, it's sort of remarkable by itself. I mean, the trick is fun to do because it's so simple, uh, but then you've also got this weird connection between the bell curve and the value of pi, which is a geometric characteristic coming from the polar coordinates. So it's just, it's a really interesting mathematical connection, I think. <clears throat> so if you want to work with this a little bit, just to sort of be happy with what you're doing, you could do an example to show that the integral of e to the minus a x squared dx is the square root of pi over a. And that's a result that we'll end up using uh, a few times later in the course. So you can prove that in a couple lines. So how is this going to help us with phase space when the phase space is high dimensional? So what we're going to do is run that trick we just did backwards, right? So what we did here is we had an integral that we didn't know how to do, and we manipulated it so that we could swap to polar coordinates and use our knowledge of polar coordinates to do the integral in an easier way, okay? So when we go to phase space, we're going to go backwards. We're going to say, we know that a Gaussian integral is always the square root of pi. And we'll walk backwards through that to extract information about the geometry of the high dimensional space, right? So the point of the Gaussian integral is that there's this interesting connection between the geometry of the space is sort of indicated by pi, right? And the value of the integral. And so we can run that either forwards or backwards depending on what we need. So we're going to start a little bit about the derivation today. Um, and we're going to really finish the really difficult parts of the derivation in the next mini lesson. All right. So I'm going to remind you how we're going to start it up. We break the multiplicity for an ideal gas into the multiplicity associated with the real space coordinates. We'll call that, we'll label that by V because it's going to be related to the volume constraint. And then the multiplicity associated with the momentum omega P, right? And so it's important to remember there's only one phase space. Phase space contains all the XYZs and all the PX, PY, PZs. But when we're working with an ideal gas, we can, those two parts of the space are completely independent from one another. So we can treat them separately. So the coordinate space constraint is three n dimensional, and we know that every particle must be within the given volume V, right? And so for a given atom, your coordinates have to be inside this volume defined by a triple integral over your dx, dy, dz's. And so if you've got n atoms, this is volume V factor gets multiplied by itself n times. So omega V is V to the n. Uh, we'll say this again, but I, I think we already argued this even in our last mini lesson that this had to be true. Um, it's a, actually a really important physical result, right? That the multiplicity is a really strong function of volume. Right? So if you increase the volume of the system, you're going to get an exponential increase in the multiplicity, right? So that's really important. And so it sort of gives you an idea, well, you know, why does a gas want to expand into empty space if you like open a valve? And the answer is, 
it's the overwhelmingly most likely thing to have happened because expanding dramatically, exponentially increases multiplicity, right? <clears throat> so this is, I mean, just to say, there's real physics content here. Um, this is this is not just fancy pants mathing. So in the momentum space, uh, the situation is, as we mentioned in the two atom case last time, substantially more complicated. We have the momentum space constraint that the sum of all squared momentum components has to equal to 2 mu, right? Total energy is all kinetic, and so the sum of all momentum components is 2 mu, right? And so we're summing p squared over all the atoms. So whenever you see this sum of squares equals a constant, it should immediately trigger in your mind spherical geometry, right? And so this condition defines um, <clears throat> the surface of a sphere of radius square root 2 mu. But it's important that this space is also 3n dimensional, right? So we're summing from i equals 1 to n different atoms, but each atom has a px, a py, and a pz that appears in this pi squared expression. And so the total number of coordinate axes you would need to define this part of phase space is 3n, right? And so that's why I actually use the n label here is to indicate that this is the radius of a 3n dimensional sphere, right? It's specific to the number of atoms. And so let's talk about spherical geometry as a function of dimension. So we're just talking about math now. No, we've, we've stepped away for a minute from physics. And so sphere or circle or whatever means the set of all points whose square distance from a given point is the same. Okay, so in one dimension it says x squared equals r squared, right? And so the surface measure it's just the two endpoints plus minus r. So we saw that in the last mini lesson when we had one atom constrained to move along a line, right? That the only two allowed values of momentum for that atom were plus minus square root of two mu. And that's what this is saying here. The length of the segment, which is a bulk measure, it's just that distance from plus r to minus r, so it would be 2r, right? So we're going to go through this uh, increasing by dimensions, right? So in one dimension, this is a, a weird kind of circle. It's really a segment. In two dimensions, we have a circle defined by x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So that starts to be something you remember from like high school pre-calculus or something, right? And there, the surface measure is just the circumference of the circle. So it's 2 pi r. And the bulk measure is the area of the circle. So that's all the points inside this expression. And so that's pi r squared. Let's go up to three dimensions. Now we sum three coordinates equal to r squared. The surface measure is the surface area of the sphere. Uh, I missed a factor of four there, copy paste error. Surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. That matters, actually, and you'll see why. Oops. Yeah, so the surface measure of a sphere in three dimensions is 4 pi r squared. And the bulk measure is the volume, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. <clears throat> I mean, so it's useful to sort of compare the bulk measure to the surface measure in each case. Um, hopefully, you can kind of see that the derivative of the bulk measure always gives you the surface area. So I haven't actually thought through how you would get these two points. So the derivative of, I mean, I guess, so the derivative of this gives you two, and I guess that sort of gives you two here, right? Because these are just two points, 
Does that make sense? I think that's right. It's a little bit weird in one dimension. A anyway, it's definitely true. Derivative gives you the surface measure. So if we go to D dimensions, where now D is arbitrary, um, we sum up all the squareds for all the coordinates that we need in the D dimensions. It's equal to a constant R, right? And so the idea is essentially that whatever it is, because of spherical symmetry, it can only, the volume measure can only depend on R. And so we guess this column. We say there's some constant where the constant depends on the dimension times R to the D power, right? All right so in this case, C sub D is 4 thirds pi. In this case, it's pi. In this case, it's two. And so the question that we really need to answer is what is C sub D, right? Once we've got C sub D, we can take the first derivative and get the surface measure that we actually need to implement our momentum space constraint as D C D R to the D minus one. That's easy. The hard part is gonna be figuring out what is C sub D. Um, so, when the dimension is bigger than three, we call the spherical shape a uh, hypersphere, right? Again, by symmetry, the volume of a hypersphere of dimension D can only be proportional to R to the D power. Uh, so again, that's by symmetry and by, I suppose, um, even dimensional analysis could be an argument in favor of this. But then we don't know the proportionality constant, right? Once we know the proportionality constant, we're ready to go. We can get the surface area. We can get the multiplicities that we need. And so our whole job in the next mini lesson is going to be to do some tricks using Gaussian integrals to figure out the value for C sub D. And then to make these expressions physical rather than mathematical, we'll note that the dimension D will be replaced with 3N, where N is the number of particles. And this is why the value of this C sub D parameter is actually so consequential. It's not just some number, right? So it, like in three dimensions, it happens to be 4 thirds pi, which is kind of boring. But in our problem, which is in this weird abstract space, the dimension has physical content. And since the proportionality constant depends on the dimension, right, we have to actually get a really precise expression for C sub D because it actually depends on a physically important large parameter, the number of particles. So that's a macro space constraint. And so determining this value of C sub D, like if you just, you know, you just say, well, why don't you just tell me what it is, right? Why isn't there just a table of numbers? And the answer is, there's not a table of numbers because this parameter depends on important physics, namely n, all right? So next time we're gonna do the most difficult part of the calculation, which is actually extracting a value for C sub D uh, and then explaining how that leads us to a nice expression for the multiplicity. We'll take care of this dimensionality issue, this dimensionless, uh, you know, units that we need to do. Um, so see you next time.